holiday views. Sam, how many of these have you been under? Every one of them. Sam and CM, we thank both of you for all your hard work. Uh, Y'all spent over two weeks on them now, haven't you? Any last words before you? Well, welcome this fourth day of July. Happy Independence Day. Uh, what a day of celebration. I heard y'all really did that good last week. Melissa did a great job in leading and everyone else a great job in participating. And uh, just thank you all. And we have more today, uh, some special music today. And uh, I look forward to it. And we will enjoy it as we celebrate. If you will take your bulletins, turn inside. Number one, you'll see a youth summer schedule on the, this side. Okay. And please pay attention to that. And Holly, if you'd raise your hand, if you have any questions, if anybody wants to know about youth, uh, just contact Holly about it. Holly, you do have a mission trip scheduled. Would you tell us briefly about it? Just to stay in place and do so. Yeah, so we have a mission trip coming up here in July. I don't know what to look, where to look, because I'm right in the middle. Um, <laughs> So it's July 15th through the 18th. We have 12 students who are signed up um, and then three adults. So if you want to keep us in our prayers, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, we're going to Mississippi to the Andersonville Church. Um, and we're really excited to go and help them out. Um, and then we'll be back that Sunday. So. Are there, are, is the enrollment to go closed or yes. are you still accepting anyone nope. to go? Last Sunday was the deadline. Last Sunday was the deadline. Oh, very good. Well, I wasn't here last Sunday to hear that. I was watching my grandson hit a baseball. Not on Sunday. We, we didn't do that. We went to church Sunday, but uh, we did go to Austin and took some time off. And thank you all for allowing me to have some time to see my family. Uh, the highs and offerings, I will ask y'all to pay attention to that. Blood drive, July the 9th. I believe that is a different day than normal. And uh, do you want to say anything about that? Did you know anything about the change of date? Is that is that good? The Friday one month and next time on a Saturday. So there's been a little adjustment to the to the schedule. Very good. Finance Committee, July the 12th, 7 p.m. Uh, Doug, where are you? Doug's our chair of our Finance Committee. Doug's being linked in the face by German Shepherd. So, uh, uh, anyway. No choir, no bells through July. July is this correct? All right. And then Sunday School, 10 a.m. We do. Our Sunday schools are back in. Uh, in session, so anyone wanting to attend Sunday school, you can ask me or others about uh, for further information about Sunday schools. And Gina, I'm going to give you the opportunity to thank the congregation. I'm just going to take a minute just to say thank you to everybody who donated to BBS and all the great volunteers they have. A lot, a lot of adult volunteers, a lot of youth volunteers. We've had a great BBS. 72 kids, we raised $500 for Senior Connect, which is um, providing meals on wheels um, for Coffin County. Um, it was just a really good week and couldn't have a good week without all the help. So I really, really appreciate that. Congregation, thank you all for all the support that you give to our Vacation Bible School. Let's see. Yes. I have a hand up here. Sarah, come on up. I just want to update you real quickly. I've got my little signs out there, but right as of this point, we have 31 out of the 50 backpacks purchased. So we're over halfway there, and that's without our communion offering. So if you feel led and haven't already, uh, first of all, I thank everyone for all the support that's come in so far, but I'm hoping that we can get 19 more backpacks by the end of the day today. Thank you. Sarah, what is our close out there? What do we need? What are we through? Do you know? Today. Today? No. <laughs> today. So we need 19 backpacks today. There we go. All right. All right. Uh, I believe.
believe that is all. I see no hands going up. So uh, let us proceed with our worship. If you would stand and greet one another. since we don't have our hymnals in here. On the front table and the table in the back, we invite you to join in singing all six stanzas today. Thank you. 
heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will no, have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated at this time. The ushers come forward that we might present God with his thoughts and our offerings. day in which we celebrate the birth of a nation, the birth of our country, the United States of America. We thank you, Lord, for seeing us through for another year, and we pray that as a nation, we will become a people who will bow on our knees to you in prayer. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us in the coming days with the power of your spirit. May we become again a holy nation. May we, Lord, reflect your glories, your teachings. And we pray that these gifts given today will go to further the mission and ministry of your church. In Jesus' name, amen.
it's debated though today on what really is the 4th of July uh, or the Day of Independence. A lot of people celebrated it last night. I heard fireworks all over the neighborhood. And I'm glad I didn't need to go to sleep too early. Uh, but they were pretty good. They kind of shut off by 10 o'clock. It was they were pretty decent last night. Let's see what happens tonight. Uh, our government says tomorrow is the day of independence. It's the fifth. But this isn't unusual. There's been a debate upon this matter since the very beginning. Again, today's the 4th of July, Independence Day. It became a federal holiday. Now get this. My wife saw this and she looked a minute and thought. But it became a federal holiday in 1941. Now it was celebrated. It's been celebrated as the Day of Independence since 1776. But it didn't become an official federal holiday until 1941. And it was on July, it was uh, on July 4th when the delegates from the 13 colonies actually ratified it. Well, John Adams wanted the 2nd of July, get this, he wanted the 2nd of July to be the day, the day of the writing, the day of the first signing. Uh, Jefferson wanted it to be on the 4th. And since Jefferson wrote the document, I guess Jefferson got his way on the matter. Uh, and Jefferson had some help. There were several others who I believed helped. It wasn't something that just came out of his head. This was a, a work of the people. This was a work of the leadership. But he is the one that finally penned it is how we understand it today. The second great document of the United States is the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights came along much later, September 25th, 1978, or 1789, I'm getting my, <laughs> my numbers all mixed up here. 1789 uh, was when it was approved by Congress. And then it was sent out as 12 articles, 12 articles. And it was sent out to the 13 colonies for its approval. And it was then on December 15, 1791, that it was finally approved as 10 amendments to the Constitution. Though there were 12, it was reduced to amendments 3 through 12. 1 and 2, not a part of the, uh, of the Bill of Rights, but 3 through 12 were added to his amendments. And well, again, what we call or commonly refer to as the Bill of Rights. It is the first part of the First Amendment, which I think has the most particular interest to the church and to Christian and religious people. It reads, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. This brings us to today's passage. Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Now, this passage can be divided into two parts. Verses 1 through 6 of Matthew 6, or Mark 6. Mark 6, 1 through 6, is Jesus' teaching in the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth. He comes into Nazareth, he heads to the synagogue, he sets down. He rolls, the, he rolls the scroll to the prophet Isaiah and he begins to teach from Isaiah 61 and uh, Isaiah 58. 61, 1 and 2 and 58, 6. 58, 6, 61, 1 and 2 is thought to be the text that he used. That was common that uh, in the Jewish synagogues they would teach and they would teach from God's word which is that day and time was the Old Testament, which we, again, what we have adopted is the Old Testament. There's a second part of Mark 6, verses 7 through 13. And verses 7 through 13 are Jesus' call 
of his disciples and mandate to his disciples to go out and preach. It's also seen as most probably his mandate to go preach to the 72 evangelists. So, in verse 2a, we read, these are two of the verses, I think, out of those two parts that I think are most important for us to look at today. Verse 2a reads, And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. Pretty straightforward. And then in verse 12, where it says, And so they went and proclaimed that people should repent. In the first part, Jesus is exercising his authority or his God-given right to teach and to preach and to share the gospel. His authority to teach the faith. In the second part, the 12 disciples and again, most probably the 72 evangelists are mandated, not asked, mandated, Commanded, mandate it means command. Commanded, like our uh, our uh, Monday Thursday meeting, it comes from a word mandate, mandatum, mandate. So they were commanded to teach and preach and share the gospel and call people to repentance. This command is given in verse seven of that last section, verse seven. And the authority mandated uh, by the apostles also is extended to the church. And if we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we will see where this mandate to preach repentance is extended to the church of Jesus Christ. In verse, in chapter 2, verse 42, we read this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. It's a little more than just preaching. It's the practice of religion. They are mandated to practice religion. The church is mandated, commanded to practice its faith. It's not asked to. It's not pretty please be good, behave, be good, prayerful Christians. Tell people about Jesus. It's do so. Clearly, the First Amendment of the Constitution recognizes God's given right to his people to practice their faith. I believe from these passages we can conclude that God himself, Jesus, certainly commands us to be faithful, practicing Christians. It actually begins with Jesus' key role in God's new time. His new time of deliverance. He's teaching in his hometown where it says, well, like Rodney Dangerfield, he gets no respect. <laughs> that is, he runs into hostility. Verse 3, very clear, it says, they took offense at him. It's funny. I've seen people, when, when people are truly teaching and preaching the word of God, that there are some who will take offense at that. They're very offended by the gospel. They're very offended by the word of God. And they took offense at Jesus. And if they take offense at Jesus, who won't some people take offense at? Now, uh, they took offense at the more on Jesus makes this very familiar statement that a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. Well, we kind of recognize that, don't we? Have any of you ever gone off from your hometown and come back and when you left you were one thing, one person, one, you, you were at one stage of development in your life, but when you came back it was like you were a different person in many ways, certainly to the people that uh, knew you. In this case, Jesus grew up in front of them, before their eyes. He was the carpenter's son, therefore he would be a carpenter. That's how it worked. And so he's come back and coming back and taking God's authority. Well, how do you think they felt? You know, the, the hometown boy made good coming back home. Isn't always accepted in the hometown. 
I've seen grown men go back to their mother's house and they revert to a six-year-old boy when they're talking to their mother. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, I'll sit up again. It's not unusual in human practice for someone who in familiarity can, in a sense, bring contempt, but not in this sense so much contempt as it is familiarity. Well, we know you this way and not that way. And people are like this with the gospel message. When the gospel message is preached, when the word of God is taught, some people go, well, that's not how I understand it. Fine, maybe. Maybe that needs to be discussed sometimes. But sometimes when that is said, it means that I want it to be this way and not that way. And Jesus ran into that here. He comes announcing the presence and the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And apparently his understanding didn't agree with theirs. I think that's the point. His understanding didn't agree with theirs. If we consult the parallel passages of Luke chapter 4, 16 through 30, and the other parallel passage in the Gospels, Matthew 13, 53 through 58, that is verse 53 through verse 38, 58, 53 through verse 58, we see that Jesus not only makes claims about the inbreaking time of God, he makes claims about himself. Claims that I think that they were having a hard time taking. That God's, came, that God's time of deliverance was at hand. I'm not sure they had a problem with that. But when Jesus begins to teach that, he is teaching that he is God's in breaking time. He is the message. And they begin to back off. If you see these, fuse these all together, you gain a different understanding if you read all three passages, the Mark, the Matthew, and the Lucan passage. And based predominantly on the Lucan passage, we've decided, scholars have decided, I don't consider myself a scholar, I'm a poor itinerant preacher in the Methodist church. Uh, but we've concluded pretty much, or the scholars have concluded that Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and Isaiah 58, 6, or more than likely the passages that he was referencing in Luke and in some of the other yeah, portions, possibly in Matthew, maybe. You see, again, Jesus not only claims the year of the Jubilee, that's what it talks about in Luke, and that's what it talks about in Isaiah uh, chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. He is making the very claim, and this is what was so difficult, and this was what was so different. He was claiming to be the Jubilee itself. Now, the year of Jubilee was a Jewish practice that may have never been practiced. Scholars can't find a place in the time of the Jewish history where it was practiced. Jubilee was the year in which all the slaves, all the uh, were let free, were set free. And the land was returned to its original owners. That is, those original uh, families and the original uh, tribes of the Jewish nation, it was all returned. It was a great reversal. And it happened every 50 years, the year of Jubilee. And again, there's no, uh, there's no record of it having ever actually been practiced. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe they were waiting for the year of Jubilee. Maybe there's substance to Jesus himself claiming to be the Jubilee. Jesus claimed, came not to provide just salvation. He claimed to provide, to proclaim complete, complete renewal and complete restoration. What is more? Jesus not only delivered on his promises to Israel, but he extended those promises to all of the known world. And maybe that's another problem that they had with his message. It's funny sometimes how church people like to keep the gospel inside the church. And not share it with the people who need to hear the gospel. 
We preach conversion to the already converted, and sometimes we are hesitant to share the gospel message to those outside the church who are hungry and starving to hear the word of God, to hear the deliverance of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to carry out God's mighty acts, his mighty acts of deliverance. Now, the reference to the year of Jubilee, if you want to study the year of Jubilee and, and get a description of the year of Jubilee, it, a description is found in the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus. And so if you turn to Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 through 13, the year of Jubilee is prescribed, uh, uh, announced. Now, while the Old Testament merely proclaims the Jubilee will come, Jesus actually comes and affects the deliverance himself through the power and the anointing of God the Father. Both activities Fulfill Jesus' messianic role. This was his purpose. This was why he came. But to receive God's message of salvation, one must first recognize one's need for it. Some people will defend themselves by saying, well, I'm a good person. I don't need that religious stuff. I don't need to change. I'm good. I'm a good person. We're not good enough. <laughs> because we are to be as good as Jesus. We are to be transformed into his likeness, his image, his personality. But there's more. We are called and mandated and sent out as a church to exercise the Christian faith. It is not just a personal, private matter. It is more than that. It is not to be kept inside the walls of the church. And we make that big mistake. And our first response is that people might reject what I have to say. They rejected what Jesus had to say. And Jesus told them that they, the disciples in the 72, that they would reject what they had to say. More than likely, that people would. Some people will come to the Lord. Some people will come to faith. Some will hear it for what it is, the Word of God. We're called to share the gospel message with others. We're called to share the Jubilee message as it is found in the person of Jesus Christ. That He will restore us to life. Peter probably sums up the gospel of the church better than anyone else. Peter in Acts chapter 2 verses 38 and 39 says this. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Praise be to God. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord? Have you received him today? I call you that if you wish to receive Jesus today as your Lord and your Savior, that you come forward during our final hymn after our communion service. Maybe there's some who wish to join who are visiting with us today. I invite you to come as well. Maybe by transfer of membership. You know, maybe you're already a member of another church. We accept the baptism of all Christian churches. We do. If you believe Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, we will accept your baptism. That's part of being a Methodist, is we believe that we are part of a greater body of Christianity, a greater body of Christ that transcends denominational barriers. Let us now turn to our communion with
Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your law. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the need. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and His grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and joy in the redeeming Him. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with, union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the, blood of, the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast in his heavenly banquet. Through your Son and Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Broken for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. With the ushers come forward as they're coming to the gift. Some information. These are a little more difficult than the last ones we had. There are two films on them. I had to struggle a little bit in first service with them, but uh, be patient. Uh, if you take the top film and pull it off, it's a clear film, and underneath it is the bread, and then the second is a little plastic tab, and you pull it back, and is uh, the blood of Christ. And let us wait together until we can uh, all take it together.
to take the bulletins and turn the rail offering. Notice that. Well, I still look at that. Back to school. There we go. So anything you wish to give, and I believe we've got a plate for CM is going to pass around for the rail offering.
Our hymn of invitation this morning, number 437 from the Methodist hymnal, This Is My Song. Thank you. 